Welcome, everybody, to my place, this big old house called Weinberg, which means vineyard. It's been the home of the Archbishops of Brisbane for about 90 years, and it's seen a lot of things through those years. But I know for a fact that this, the, this is the first time ever that we've broadcast a Facebook Live session from here. It's also the first time I've ever done it. You might be an old hand at this sort of thing, but I'm not. So thanks to uh, those joining us live, but also to anyone watching later on the rebroadcast. For the next 30 minutes, we're going to consider the question why Jesus matters in modern Australia, and I mean really matters. Uh, I'm going to give some thoughts of my own over the next 15 minutes, and then I'll take your questions, whatever they are. I'm keen for your feedback throughout the live stream. So I invite you to start by letting me know where you're watching from. You could be anywhere. So let me know where you're watching. In fact, we did a test run only uh, a few days ago and, and we heard someone from, uh, quickly from someone from Canada. So uh, wherever you are, let me know where you're watching from. If you know some friends or family that would like to join in tonight, share this live stream post now. Uh, I'm going to share it now to my Facebook page. Uh, to invite my friends to, to join in with us. So the question then is, why does Jesus really matter in modern Australia? Someone who lived over 2,000 years ago. Now, I was Archbishop of Canberra before ever I became Archbishop of Brisbane, and I remember one day there I had a, a group of young school leavers come to my place in Canberra for lunch. Two boys, two girls, outstanding young people, and no free lunches at Archbishop's House. So I said to them towards the end of lunch, OK, at the end of your years of Catholic schooling, who, who do you say Jesus is? And it was a very good discussion, but at the end of it all, they agreed that Jesus was a great role model and they had to really strive their very best to imitate Jesus as a role model who lived long ago and good, gave good example. Now, I said to them, OK, that's fine, but if Jesus is nothing more than a role model, then it's, it's hardly worth the effort, Christianity. Um, we've got lots of good role models. Uh, we don't need another one in that sense. Uh, if Jesus is only a wise teacher... Who cares? Why does he matter now? Because we've got lots of wise teachers. If Jesus is only a miracle worker, again, in the end, who cares? Because we have other wonder workers. Now, what makes the difference with Jesus is the fact that he died on the cross. Now, the death makes all the difference, but it's not the full story. Because what people like me believe is that Jesus was executed brutally. He was put in a tomb. They saw him buried. Stone rolled across the entrance to the tomb and they thought that was the end of the penny section. That was it. Full stop. But then, three days later, they encounter him in a way that they had never imagined. He wasn't the same as before, but he wasn't just a ghost either because he ate fish with them and that sort of stuff. So he'd entered some new dimension of existence, but, but he was real. This wasn't a figment of their imagination. And the stories that you find at the end of the Gospels of them bumping into Jesus, as it were, or he bumping into them, risen from the dead, are extraordinary stories. And they give you the clue to what the Christian life is all about. They're stories of encounter. Uh, he walks through a locked door into a room where they're gathered, and yet he is a body. Uh, he's there on a beach cooking fish for them for breakfast, this sort of thing. They're weird stories, and they're not the kind of stories you would make up if this was all just fiction or propaganda. They, have, they smack of, a, of reality, and they're, they're odd stories because the experience was odd. It was weird, and they didn't know what to make of it. Jesus matters there not just as a good example or a wise teacher or a wonder worker who lived all those years ago. Jesus matters because once he rises from the dead, he's no longer the prisoner of time and space. He's everywhere. You kind of drown in Jesus. 
So he, he is presence and power here and now. And the Christian life is all about encountering him as a kind of power in my life that I can't supply for myself. In the midst of my weakness, I encounter him as a kind of strength that turns even my weakness into his kind of strength. Or where I am wounded, he touches me as a kind of healing power and presence and the wound becomes a fountain. From that moment of encounter, I become a disciple. And this is crucial. In other words, someone who doesn't just respect Jesus or admire Jesus or like Jesus, someone, I become someone who absolutely uh, is determined to follow Jesus wherever he goes and he takes you into some strange places. Uh, I can say that I love him, which is weird language in one sense, given that I've never actually seen him. But, but in fact, the eye of faith does see him and the ear of faith hears him. Because you see, the Holy Spirit opens the eye of faith and opens the ear of faith. And once, once you see him and hear him with the eye and ear of faith, you see him and hear him everywhere. There's nowhere that Jesus is not. John Paul II when he first became Pope, wrote a remarkable letter to the Catholic people all around the world. It's called an encyclical letter. And in that letter, he said at one point, Christianity isn't really a religion in any conventional sense. He said it's an experience. And he's right. An experience of what? He says it's an experience of encounter. You encounter the risen Jesus here and now and wherever and whenever. And that moment of encounter is a moment of amazement, the Pope says. So the Christian life becomes an experience of amazement born of that encounter. And the amazement comes because it's only when you see and hear the risen Jesus that you really come to understand the full magnificent truth of who God really is. A lot of uh, the gods whom we worship are, are tin pot gods. But when you see the truth of who God really is, it, it's a magnificent and amazing thing. But it's only in seeing and hearing the risen Jesus that you discover who the human being really is uh, and who you really are. He is more yourself than you are. You want to know who you are, who I am? You better find your way to the risen Jesus because he tells us the real, the full truth of who God is and who the human being is, who you are, who I am. And that is an experience of amazement. So that's the Christian life and that's why Jesus really matters to people like me, certainly, and I hope to you. So in the end, if I'm asked why Jesus matters in, in contemporary Australia, I, I'd give four reasons. The first is that when he dies on the cross, on the dark mountain, Jesus enters every dark corner and dark depth of the human heart and human history. Uh, and what that says is because he's everywhere in every darkness, there is nothing and nowhere and nobody that cannot be redeemed, that cannot enter a fantastic fullness of life. So that's the first reason. He's in every dark place and depth. The question is not, is he there, but how can I see him? The second reason I think why he, he really matters is that when he rises from the dead, scars shining like the sun, Jesus says to, to the cosmos that death doesn't have the last word. Now, there are many different kinds of death, and you see it in a place like contemporary Australia. There can be a spiritual death, an emotional death, the death that comes with addiction. It goes on and on. And very often we inhabit a world, even in Australia, where death does seem to have the last word. And here comes Jesus in the midst of all of that saying, not true. The truth is that death has its power, but it never has the last word. 
the last word in, in contemporary Australia and forever and everywhere belongs not to death but to life. And that is a crucial truth. So he matters for that reason too. The third reason why I think Jesus really matters in contemporary Australia is because in him alone do we discover who God really is and who, who the human being really is. And in, in contemporary Australia, very often, we see the tiniest sliver of who God really is, or we see a false God, or we, we only glimpse the full truth of the human being and we think, that is that all there is? But here's Jesus speaking to us the full truth of who God really is and who the human being really is, and, and inviting us to see more. See, one of the things that makes life feel claustrophobic for a lot of people in Australia is that they don't see enough. They see too little. But Jesus is the one who in that moment of encounter opens the eye to see more and more and more. It's a kind of an infinite journey into an endless seeing. And that's another reason why he matters in a society which often doesn't see nearly enough. And then the fourth reason is that in, in the encounter with him, we discover that the nobodies or the losers or the least really do matter because they're the ones in whom we find him. Remember what he says uh, in the last judgment scene in Matthew's gospel? Uh, as long as you did this to the least of my brothers and sisters, you did it to me, to those who seem to be losers. And there are a lot of people in a culture like ours that so values success who are regarded as losers, as nobodies. They don't matter. They're the least who can be kind of thrown away, part of the throwaway culture. So think of all of those people who are marginal, who don't matter, and that's where you'll find Jesus in contemporary Australia. And because he's there, they matter. And because he's with them, he really matters. So because he's entered every dark place, because he says life and not death has the last word, because he reveals the full truth of who God is, who we are, and because he says the losers, the least, are my brothers and sisters, and they matter absolutely, we have reasons there for why he matters in contemporary Australia, but not just in contemporary Australia, why he matters always and everywhere. Enough from me. I've talked a fair bit, got on a roll. It's over to you now. So questions from wherever. Uh, one question that, uh, that's come in already uh, says, that's all very fine but how in real terms can I get to encounter Jesus in my life? Uh, this is a, a crucial question because there's nothing vague about the Christian life, this, this life of discipleship, following Jesus, encountering him. Again, I'd, I'd, I'd make four points and they're not hard to know. This is not rocket science. The first thing is you've got to read the Gospels. Now, there's my poor old battered Bible. This has been travelling the world with me for God knows how long, and it's just about falling apart, but it's part of my journey big time. I'm going to get buried with this Bible, I hope. Um, you've got to read the Gospels. I remember once meeting a young Chinese uh, Catholic, a lay, he was a lawyer, and he was a lay leader in Catholic, the Catholic Church in China, and I, um, I said to him, Kevin, what advice would you give young people in Australia uh, in trying to be Christian? Without a moment's hesitation, Kevin said, I would order them in good old Confucian style. I would order them to, to read the gospel for five minutes every day. And I said, Kevin, why, why would you do that? And he said, because how else would you get to know Jesus than by reading the gospels? And I was very interested the other day to see where Pope Francis said the same thing in a message to young people in... Um, in Argentina, you've got to read the Gospels and the Jesus you meet there is the real Jesus. So that's the first thing. Read the Gospels and don't just skim read them, really read them. The second thing is prayer. And when I talk about prayer, I mean praying alone, but I also mean praying in a community. So prayer that's personal and prayer that's communal. Uh, and prayer, remember, for Christians is primarily a listening. You've got to learn to listen. 
if you're gonna hear the voice of Jesus. So read the gospels, pray, personal and communal prayer. The, the, um, find yourself in a community. You can't do it on your own, none of us can. Community can be a burden, but, but it's also a great gift. And it's absolutely essential if you want to meet Jesus, the real Jesus, and not a Jesus who looks and sounds just like you, so that you, you end up worshipping yourself in the end. So find a community that can take you to the real Jesus. And the fourth thing is serve the poor. Whoever they are, wherever you are, they're there, sometimes hidden. But if you really, and again, Pope Francis has helped us uh, see this, Go and, go and encounter the poor and that's where you'll see the face of Jesus and hear his voice. So read the Gospels. Pray, um, uh, go and meet the poor. Uh, th these, are, these are some of the very practical, concrete ways that will certainly lead you to encounter Jesus Christ risen from the dead. But you have to be patient and you have to be ready for a surprise or two. That's the other thing I'd say. Because Jesus often surprises. He never disappoints, but he often surprises. So, so you, you can't be a prisoner of your own expectations. Now we have uh, questions from Suva, from Singleton. <laughs> Tambourine Mountain. Hello, Tambourine Mountain from the Blue Mountains. Uh, and there's a question from someone who's got the magnificent name, Greek name, Theotokos. It means God-bearer. It's usually the Greek word for the mother of Jesus. Um, can you talk about Jesus in Australia without acknowledging the first peoples who have witnessed injustice, extreme suffering and uh, loss of just about everything? The answer is no. And that's one of the reasons I talked about uh, Jesus identifying with, in a radical way, the poor, the least, the marginal. In my experience, I, I can think of no more marginal people in Australia than our Indigenous peoples. Uh, we, we've been talking and thinking about reconciliation, the need for it in these recent days here in Australia. But, but I think to, um, to go and meet Indigenous peoples, and I grew up in a world down in Melbourne where I hardly saw an Indigenous person, or at least one that I recognised when I was growing up. It's a bit different up in Queensland where I am now. But, uh, but I think if we are talking about uh, the least of the brothers and sisters of Jesus in this country, at least, we have to talk about, uh, we have to talk about the indigenous peoples of Australia. Uh, it's a running sore at the heart of this nation. And, I can't, and, and the churches have a bit to answer for too in the way the indigenous peoples have been treated. And yet the churches, the disciples of Jesus, I mean, not these big faceless institutions, but the disciples of Jesus, I think, have got a crucial role in healing the running sore at the heart of the nation because of the power of the gospel. And uh, so the answer is we, ha we, ha we as disciples of Jesus, we really have to go and, and, uh, and enter into the world that is, is so wounded, the word of the world of the indigenous peoples of this country. Jimmy, I don't know where you are, Jimmy, but uh, you've asked, where do I encounter Jesus mostly? Uh, scripture, I come back to this. I mean, I was, I was trained to teach scripture, to study scripture. Um, and uh, it, it's turned out to be not just an experience of study and teaching, but an experience of hearing a living voice. And it's been a huge part of my life. Um, so for me, scripture is, is absolutely crucial in my encounter with Jesus. Uh, it, these aren't old words. The, the, these words come off the page like a blowtorch sometimes. And, and there's a living voice there. If you, if you hang around long enough, uh, you'll hear it all right. And it often in very surprising way. So the other thing for me is prayer. Uh, it's become more and more important as I've got a bit older, <laughs> and I hope wiser. Um, for me now, it's like the air I breathe, and I, I spend about an hour each morning in prayer. And again, that's a listening to the voice of Jesus, a kind of seeing his face too. Uh, and then the service of the people. I, I, uh, some things I have to do as a bishop, I I don't like it at all, but I love what I'm doing and I love serving the people as a bishop and in them, 
I encounter Jesus in all kinds of ways, particularly those who are wounded or feel overwhelmed by their weakness. So the experience of the, the, the ministry as a priest and as a bishop, that for me is, uh, is a crucial part of my encounter with the Lord at the heart of the church. Uh, the church can be uh, <laughs> a tough place sometimes, especially for people like bishops, but without the church, I think what I would end up with would be uh, worshipping me and not, uh, not Jesus. Uh, Sabrina. Hi, Sabrina. Your question. How do we bring Jesus to the youth, the future of the church in Australia? Uh, it's obvious that, she, Sabrina says, that many churches aren't engaging with youth. And th this is true, Sabrina. I, wherever I go on visitation, and, and I try and do as much of that as I can at getting out into the communities, this is a question that, uh, that I hear time and time again. How can we engage young people? Now, there's no, there's no magic answer to that, but I would say that y you will never engage any young person by trying to bash them over the head with an ideological package uh, or, or a, merely a, a, a set of ethics or a philosophy, uh, all that stuff. I, I think they, they just look the other way. But if you can in some way give them an experience of Jesus, and that's important, not just words about Jesus. I know I'm speaking a lot of words here, but, but the crucial thing is to give them an experience of Jesus, the power of his love. Uh, that's what can light the spark. So, uh, so I, I, to, to, to give young people an experience of Jesus, become that experience yourself in the way you relate to young people. Uh, I think that that's the, the if we try and just give them institution or ideology, they'll they'll be uh, turned off every time. Uh, if there's a sense of alienation, no no sense of acceptance and community, they'll be turned off every time. But if you can give them a glimpse of Jesus, that glimpse is enough to to change their lives. Mark, good name. Um, your question: What advice would you give a lapsed Catholic scared of returning to the church? Well, first of all, Mark, I'd have to say I completely understand why you'd be scared or apprehensive. Uh, I don't know your story, and what I do know is that every story is different. Every spiritual journey is different. And you, you seem to be a guy who is on a, a serious spiritual journey. I guess you were brought up Catholic, but like so many, you decided at some point to, to take another path. But perhaps you're, you're feeling the, the attraction of Jesus himself to come back to the community of disciples. I hope that's the way you see it. Again, if all you're doing is returning to an, a big institution and a, a, an oppressive ideology, forget that. But you've got nothing to fear if coming back to the church is coming to Jesus in a new way at this stage of your spiritual journey. Uh, sometimes people are afraid when they say yes to Jesus, when they really follow him, they're going to lose too much. But the thing is, you lose nothing. If you say yes to Jesus, you gain far more than you ever lose. So if, you, if, it's, if it's the Lord calling you back into the community of disciples, Mark, you've got nothing to fear. Uh, so don't see it as returning to this great big ogre institution, the, you know, the Roman Catholic Church. We are that. But, but it, we're, we're flesh and blood, uh, all of us wounded, seeking the healing that only Jesus can bring. So all I can say is come and join us on the journey. <laughs> Matthew, um, your question, how can we witness to Jesus at school or university? <clears throat> There's no magic package to this or no instant program that I can sort of uh, give you on Facebook Live. The, the, the most important way for you to witness to Jesus, Matthew, is to, to actually encounter Jesus. Because, you see, that will change you, not, not overnight, it doesn't work like that, but that encounter with Jesus will change you in ways that you yourself mightn't recognise, but others will. There'll be something different about you. It's the kind of difference that people in the gospel sense in Jesus. They all recognise he was different. He wasn't like the others. This man teaches with authority and so on, they said. So it's the same with the disciple of Jesus. Um, 
people do notice a difference. You know, if you really are a man of peace, not violence, love, not fear, uh, and if all of this comes from that experience of encounter with Jesus, you'll be doing all the witnessing you have to do. But again, I repeat, Matthew, don't try and do it on your own. It gets too hard. It was never meant to be something we do on our own. So, so witness to Jesus at school or university, absolutely crucial. Um, but, uh, but, but do it with others and, and just find your way to Jesus and, and he'll do the rest. Pope Francis was asked the other day, you know, are you trying to reform the church? He said, no, 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 no. I'm just trying to ensure that Jesus is at the centre of the church and he'll do the reforming. So just try and make sure Jesus is the centre of your life, not just as someone you respect or admire, but someone you love and follow, and, and he'll do the rest. Robert, uh, how do we keep growing young lay leadership in the church? This is another really good question because I presume, Robert, that you and probably most of those tuning in now are baptised. Now, if you've been baptised, uh, you're called to leadership of some kind or another. And young people, I think in a special way, are being called to leadership in the church now. One of the things you notice about the, the stories of the first Christians encountering Jesus after he rose from the dead is they always get a job. And how do you know it's the real Jesus you've, you've met, you've encountered? Answer, did you get a job? Because if you didn't, it's not the real Jesus. So, Robert, I'd say I don't know who you are or where you are. But I do know that you are being called, I guess as a younger layperson, to lead in the church. The only question is how. Now, again, let Jesus tell you that. It's not just a bureaucratic or administrative question. Let Jesus tell you what kind of leadership he wants you to have in his community of disciples. Uh, therefore, you've got to learn to listen to him. But, but believe me, if you learn to listen, and it takes a bit of patience, here I'm talking prayer. Jesus will, will, will show you. Uh, the other thing is um, you've got to be in the church. Even your question has, has the words. Uh, you can't do it on your own. So find a community which is a spiritual home. Listen to the Lord and you, he'll answer the, quest, the very good question that you answer there. Uh, JB. Hi, JB. <laughs> Um, how can Jesus' life and mission be actualised in the Plenary Council? Well, the Plenary Council, I think, as many people know, perhaps all of you, is a big decision that uh, the church has taken in Australia and, and under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's all about Jesus because, again, we're interested in, in renewal in the church, but not just... Uh, for, as a political or, or bureaucratic or administrative thing, uh, the kind of renewal we're interested in in the Plenary Council is, is how can we be Jesus in, in, in the real situation of contemporary Australia because that's the call. Now, throughout this journey to the Plenary Council and beyond, the key word is listening. And, and all of us, the whole church, when we talk about a Plenary Council, Plenary just means full. And it means everybody. So, so whoever you are out there, if you're in this country at least, it's, it means you. But we're all trying to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit uh, to know what exactly we are being called to uh, at this time in, in contemporary Australia. What's it mean for us to be uh, a more prayerful church, to be a more missionary church, a more inclusive church? a poor church, a joyful church. These are the questions at the heart of the Plenary Council. And that's how I, I, I am certain the Spirit will ensure that we do actualise the life and mission of Jesus through the, uh, the grace of the Council. Uh, I th look, there are more questions, but I think we've run out of time. Uh, I could sit here all night like, well, not all night, but... <laughs> It's been uh, a fascinating first experience for me. I wasn't uh, sure what to expect, but thanks for making it the, uh, the real gift to me personally um, that it's been. So uh, wherever you are and whoever you are, um, thanks for joining me here tonight here at Weinberg and thanks for your contributions, questions and uh, 
and, and others. And let's hope we can do it again. Um, th this might be a good thing to do from time to time, but, uh, but it's certainly been worth doing as far as I'm concerned, and I hope it was for you too. Just on a final note, I can't go without talking about the big event of the week, and that's the uh, first State of Origin game tomorrow night, even if it is down in Melbourne which is foreign territory for rugby league. Um, in fact, we have to celebrate uh, uh, the, uh, the nine of the 17 Queensland players who are former students of our Catholic schools. Doesn't necessarily mean to say Catholics are better at league, but we've got nine of the 17 from our schools. So we're very proud of those guys. And um, with them and with everyone up this way, we say, go Maroons. <laughs> Thanks very much for joining in. We'll see you next time. God bless.